الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم living in times in which change is happening at such a rapid rate, it's unprecedented in the history of uh, human society. Because we are moving rapidly toward the last days. Nabi Muhammad والسلام, said that the greatest tests and trials that mankind will ever experience from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last day would be the fitna of the Dajjal the fitna of the Dajjal, the false messiah who seeks to impersonate the true messiah ma fi shi min yawm khalaq Allah Adam ila an taqoom al-sa'ah akbar min al-Dajjal the Dajjal is one eye, or he's blind in one eye. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, every Prophet has warned his people about the job. And the Prophet knew, alayhi salam, warned his people about the job. But I am going to tell you something no one ever said before me. The job sees with his left eye, he's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. And your Lord is not one-eyed. And the Prophet وسلم, used to repeat this until the Sahaba thought he would not stop. And on his forehead are written the words Kafir. Kafir. And anyone, whether they're literate or illiterate, they can read the word Kafir on the forehead of the Dajjal, all the believer. And as for his left eye, even that will not be clear. But rather he will have something that will look like a film of... You find in the end of time when the Dajjal arrives with the enormity of his fitan, there is in that small group of resistance a great degree of perception. That they will perceive him, even those who are illiterate cannot read, but they can perceive that that is kufa, that is a kafa, that is a disbeliever. The Quran says that the heart can see. I compare him to Abdul Uzza ibn Qatan who is short, hen toed with curly hair and white, as in his skin will be fair. And he said that it will be reddish white. Now the Prophet said that the Dajjal would enter every city on the planet. When they asked him what would his speed be like, he said like a wind that leaves a cloud in its trail. And they asked him, in Sahih, it's a Sahih Hadith, كيف سرعته يومئذين يا رسول الله? And he said, كريحن or كغيثن استدبرت السحاب, like a wind that leaves behind condensation. And then in another Hadith, يركب حمار, حمارا ما بين أذنيه أربعون دراعا. He rides a donkey that has 40 cubits between its ears. Right? And I had a list of wingspans and, and worked out that actually the Learjet is almost exactly uh, 40 cubits. And the Prophet wasallam also mentioned his hair and that it will be short and curly. He is a man with curly hair, thick twisted hair. The original meaning of anti in Greek as, as, a, as a prefix means instead of. And that's closer to the Arabic interpretation which is imposter or in place of. The Dajjal, the Prophet وسلم, mentioned the Dajjal literally and linguistically means Dajjal is deception. Dajjal literally means the liar, the deceiver. The other meaning of Dajjal means to spread the earth to cover it with filth. And literally the word in Arabic, and I, I won't use a foul word, but the word in Arabic literally means crap. 
that they will spread the earth with crap. And if there's one thing that sums up the age we're in, it's that the earth has been flooded with foulness. And he will say, I have the fire and I have water. But his water will be Jahannam, or uh, of the effects of Jahannam, his water will be fire and his fire will be water. That will be the nature of his Dajjal. So the way he will be successful is that people won't know who the Dajjal is. They won't know what he will do. They won't know the trials that he will bring. Because he will fool people through this false doctrine, this false teaching, in which he gets many people to follow him. People are following someone whose powers are so limited, and whatever he has with him is a reversal of what is true. In times of difficulties and trials and tribulations, appearance and reality are not always the same. Something that might appear to be correct might not be correct. Something that appears to be truthful might not be truthful. Now what I've noticed is that a lot of Muslims are almost embarrassed to mention the end of time. It's like you never hear it. And that in itself is a sign of the end of time. One of the signs of his arrival is that the khutaba and the mashayikh, they stop talking about this Antichrist, Al-Masih al-Dajjal. The Prophet wasallam mentioned that the Dajjal will not appear until people are neglectful and the Imams forget to mention the Dajjal upon the Manabir. When the Imams and the scholars and the leaders of the community forget to mention the Dajjal on the Minbar, in the Jum'ah Khutbah, in their lectures, this is a sign in and of itself that the Dajjal's time is near. He is about to come. Rarely is there a Khutbah of Jum'ah and the Dajjal. I lived in the Middle East for almost 10 years and I never heard a khutbah on the Sihah Dajjal. In the end he said, when is the last hour going to come? When is the world going to end? And he said, the questioner who is asking me, or the person you are asking, is no more knowledgeable about its, hour, about its time than the questioner. Meaning you and I don't know. I don't know any better than you. So we asked him, what are its signs, some of its signs, when it comes close? The hour is drawing near. All of our lives are dissipating. The scholars say that the minor signs have been completed. If you look, there is not one of them that has not manifested. Because before the appearance of Ad-Dajjal, there are many, many signs, minor signs. We've gone almost through them all. He says the signs before the end of time are like pearls on a string. But when the string is cut, then the pearls, they come out one after the other. The Prophet ﷺ said that there would be great difficulties. One of the things that he said, he, he said, Inna hadhi umma, aw ummati ummatum marhuma. My ummah is a ummah, it's a community that has the mercy of God on it. It's a marhuma. And then he said, Ju'ila adabuha fi dunyaha. The, the difficulties of this ummah, the chastisement of this ummah is in this world. Al fitan, wal balaya, wal zalazil social strife, tribulations, calamities, and earthquakes. The believers will be in a very hard time. People neglect the hereafter in order to buy the luxuries of this world in exchange for the hereafter. Another one would be speed in travel. He said great distances would be traversed in very short times. And he said also that uh, people would hop between the clouds and, and the earth increase in literacy. In fact, so many people will be able to read and write, but actually knowledge will decrease. The Prophet ﷺ said, that a man will marry a man and a woman will marry a woman. And now this is in the legislation in the Supreme Court in the United States of America in which they have legalized in certain states the marriage of two of the same sex. Bribery and adultery prevail. He said, which would be whisperings, like there would be many confused people that would have a lot of psychological type of problems. Men imitating women. Women imitating men. Killing. Widely spread killing. To the extent that the one who is being killed and the one who is killing, they don't even know. The one who is being killed doesn't know why he's being killed. He said also that people would have sexual intercourse in front of other people was a sign of the end of time. In another hadith, Rasul said, when the son, when the son, the boy, son, he chooses his friend 
closer and distances his father away. And he said, they'll, they'll wake up monkeys and pigs. And this is called Mesk. And the Mesk of the people of the last days is an internal Mesk. It doesn't mean they literally take the forms of monkeys and pigs. Their inner reality will be monkeys and pigs. Fact is, that is what you're imitating. We see the disrespect of the young people for the older people. We see wine and intoxicants spread all over the land. He's saying when you see young men, there are many of them, and there are large numbers together, hanging out in certain places or going together, and you cannot see any signs of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their faces as a whole, then wait for the last hour to come. We're talking about from the Ummah of the Prophet. Another sign would be nakedness, that people would begin to remove their clothes. And he said until it would get to the point where people would actually walk around in the marketplaces in shorts with their thighs fully exposed. When the mother gives birth to a daughter or son, and this daughter becomes like a boss, a master over her, as if her mother is her slave. Did our prophet make mention of the fact that our cities would be bombed with impunity, and the Muslims would sit by and watch it happen? And some of them would watch it happen on the news and then go back to their dinner. And he said women will be dressed and yet be naked. If there is something of worldly benefit to them, the salat becomes the last thing on their mind. When waladu ghayda and children would be filled with rage. They have in many inner city schools in the United States, they have to have a gun search before they go in. Also the Prophet mentioned that there would be the increase in the use of riba, which means usury, interest, credit cards, mortgages, things like that. In fact, the, to the extent that no one would be able to escape the dust of it. And wealth would be only amongst the elite, the rich people. And this is happening. Wealth is, is, is increasing and going into a smaller and smaller number of people. Business becomes so important that it reaches to the level to the point where the woman feels that it is necessary to help her husband earn, earn an income to have a stable life. In the morning he is a believer and by the evening he becomes a disbeliever. He said there will be poor people who were uh, the desert people and they were poor and they were taking care of goats and, and animals and then they'll begin to build huge buildings. These are signs before your very eyes. You, we're seeing signs of our Prophet ﷺ. He told us that you will see the, the buildings of Mecca reach the mountaintops. People will start considering those who have no knowledge as knowledgeable. And the helm, the height of it will be when the Dajjal comes. What is wrong will be believed as being correct. And then you will see professional liars who can take the truth and make it seem false. And they take what is false, and they make it seem true. They distort things. First casualty in times of trials and tribulations is what? It's the truth. Truth and falsehood is murky. You don't know what the truth is. You don't know what you should do. You need knowledge more than ever before. A person becomes so confused about what is happening in the world so deluded by everything that they see and hear that they're not going to know what to do and where to go and who to stand with. Most peoples are in such a state of disequilibrium, whether in the West or in the East, there's just a state of disequilibrium everywhere. And you will see it increase. And this is part of the end time scenario. Honestly, just look at today, the, world, the way the world is created. It's like, you know, the homo, Sapien, the man of understanding has become all of a sudden the homo scenicus. He's become the man of entertainment. We have altered the way that we even perceive the world. It's like Caesar would say things like, you know, give them bread and give them circuses. Right? That it will be enough to, to suffice for them. Feed them and entertain them. And then you become uh, completely passive. If you simply provide people food and give them the daily dose of fantasy, then that is enough to keep them passive. This is social psychology. You are being manipulated like mice in a maze. All of these groups secretly worship and dedicate themselves to a one-eyed global leader. 
and they are desperately waiting for this one-eyed global leader and they believe they firmly believe and they are desperately waiting for him and they have made every arrangement for his arrival one of them is the social system that is being prepared for the Dajjal and what that is if you look on the dollar bill the pyramid with the eye the one eye which is hovering above the pyramid the pyramid is being built in order for the Dajjal the final piece to come onto the pyramid now the fascinating thing about that pyramid is if you look at the pyramid it's three-dimensional in other words it has abad but if you look at the eye the eye is one-dimensional it doesn't have depth average orthodox Jew when they look toward Philistine and holding uh, the West Bank and Gaza they are holding onto that territory and maintaining it because they believe that a Messiah is coming the Jews are announcing two years ago that the Red Heifer was born. People don't even know what this stuff means. And this deceiver cannot deceive people so perfectly until a road or an environment has been prepared for his coming. He can't just go in like that. It has to be prepared. And then hopefully we need some global leadership. The Dajjal, which, who, when he comes, he comes at the head of a global uh, type of government. We are seeing everything moving towards one world government globalization one world culture this is the type of condition that we're in it's unbelievable we're literally daydreaming going through life daydreaming prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said fa idha ra'ayta dhalika fanajat najah if you see this happening in your time then seek refuge seek refuge find a solution to get away from all of this don't get constricted about their plots don't get constricted about all of the things that they're doing against you and then he says, if you have taqwa and if you're patient, Allah is with you. The US dollar is not collapsing on its own to any economic reasons. What have you done to investigate the off-balance sheet transactions conducted by the Federal Reserve, which according to Bloomberg, now total $9 trillion in the last eight months? I'll have to look specifically at that Bloomberg article. I, I'm not... I, I don't know if I have actually seen that particular one. That's not the point. It is a controlled demolition job. And this is constant monitoring of people. You go with your credit card now, they're literally eliminating cash. That's their goal. And they've already articulated these goals. This is not some kind of uh, craziness. They want to eliminate the use of cash. And a new international monetary system is around the corner. I predicted the fall of the Soviet Empire in about 10 years time in 1980 and it fell on time so in year 2000 I made a prediction of 2025 for the US Empire but then George W Bush was elected president and I saw him as an accelerator of the process so he was 2020 but I don't want it to collapse for one because when empires collapse you get a void and you get wars either physical wars or economic wars and you get a new empire they say that they are promoting democracy but what they are basically doing are, is promoting the financial and geopolitical interests of the global power elite embedded inside the united states britain the european union and israel everywhere in the world that oil was discovered the zionists ensured they took control of it they even had control of venezuela's oil until Hugo Chavez came up. So we'll have a dramatic and monumental increase in the price of oil. The price of food increasing, the price of transport increasing, the price of manufactured goods increasing, cost of living rising and rising and rising. We'll also have a monopoly of both energy and knowledge. And this is what they have now. You see, they have a monopoly of energy, which is the oil. That's the energy of the age and of what's called the information. They have all the information they're storing. Oil is the most valuable resource on the planet today. And who controls it? 
is extremely important. Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا. Allah has a bigger plan than you know. You will have to know everything about everything. Allah has placed a plan that is light years ahead of what we can see right now. The social system that they're building, the social order in which they want to bring people in. Now one of the interesting things in the Quran is it said, لَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيُهُودُ وَلَا نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتُهُمْ Now Allah said, حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتُهُمْ and didn't say دِينَهُمْ you see, Allah could have said, حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ دِينَهُمْ But Allah said, مِلَّتُهُمْ Now if you look at the difference between deen and milla, deen is your individual relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَدِينُ islam. But your milla is the collective social reality. So what this means is that the, the Jews and the Christians will not stop until They'll let you keep your deen, but you have to follow their milla. Because the next 20 years are going to be very interesting in this encounter between Zionism and the world of Islam. When Iraq is denied its currency, what will be your state and what will you do? When a sham, when its currency is denied, and what will you do when Egypt, its currency will be denied? and you return to where you began in the first place. When a country falls, its currency falls as well. The Rasul Azam was asked, how will it fall? And he said, by foreign intervention. You think it's over for Egypt right now? According to this hadith which is in Bukhari and Muslim, something else is coming up. When a currency of a nation falls, it means that the country itself falls. Sometimes whenever the Prophet ﷺ discussed Constantinople, uh, certain authors, certain individuals, they tend to think that this referred to Muhammad al-Fatih. Muhammad al-Fatih, no doubt, his victory was a sublime victory for the Muslims and it remains to uh, be an example of a great historical example, but this is not necessarily what the Prophet ﷺ was discussing. That city is forgotten. It plays no role in the affairs of the Arabian Peninsula. The strategic affairs of Jazeera al Arab, what role that Medina plays? Zero. <laughs> The Dajjal will not appear until the Romans land in Al A'ma. They will gather against the Muslims and the Muslims will get together against them. Bear in mind the word Romans here is just a general Arabic word for European. Al Malhama, it is described to me to be, according to their terminologies too, as the Armageddon. It's the one in which it's a great battle between the truth and falsehood. 80 flags against the Muslim nation by itself. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the Romans would come to you with 80 flags and under each flag would be 12,000 soldiers. This is, Allah Alam, a clear indication of the United Nations or something similar to it. Even a bird would not be able to reach from one side to the other. And the Romans will be much greater in numbers comparing to the Muslims. So every one of them, the Muslims, here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that this army will be into three groups. The one that is defeated by withdrawing because of their fee. The other one that is martyred and they are the best of martyrs. And then another one Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described that they are the ones who will be granted victory. Allah will cause it to be that the enemy retreats and the Muslims have victory. The Khilafah is not going to encompass the entire Muslim world. Rather, it's going to be centered in Asham. Asham means Lebanon, Syria, parts of Jordan, Palestine. They call it today Israel, I'll call it Israeli territories are in there. Palestine, 
and parts of Turkey. This was a sham. The condition of these lands reflects the condition of the rest of the Ummah. If they're in trouble, the rest of the Ummah is in trouble, as per the wording of the Prophet in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, one of the signs of the right before the Mahdi is Iraq is, is uh, sanctioned and the wheat is not able to get to it nor uh, any money. A righteous person will be their Imam and he will be from my family, from the offspring of Fatima radiallahu anha. Allah will make him suitable to be the Khalifa in a night. And his name will be like mine, and his father's name will be like mine. He will have a broad forehead and a prominent nose. He will fill the earth with equity and justice as it was filled with oppression and tyranny, and he will rule for seven years. Al Mahdi, the awaited Mahdi who will lead the Ummah of Islam, his name is Muhammad, son of Abdullah, will come out and he will lead the Muslim Ummah of the world into justice. A Muslim ruler will die and there will be disagreement concerning succession. And he'll hurry from Medina to Mecca. When the people of Mecca come out to him, they'll force him to accept the bay'ah, the oath of allegiance which legitimizes the leadership of the Amir al-Mu'mineen. But after he proclaims himself al-Mahdi, he's going to be attacked from an army. And when an army is between Medina and Mecca going down south, the earth is going to open and swallow that army. That is the sign of all signs. Beyond the shadow of a doubt. Anyone who claims who says I'm the Mahdi, he's not the Mahdi because the Mahdi actually doesn't want Bayah. He'll, he'll take Bayah in Mecca at the Rukan and, and people will say, Nubayyuka, and he says, I don't want Bayah. The main sign the process in reference, the black flags from Khorasan. He said, when you see the black flags, the army coming from Khorasan to protect the Mahdi in the Kaaba, that is the sign. That that's it, clearly he is the Mahdi. He says, I was shown the east and the west of this earth. And I saw the dominion of my Ummah. I saw the kingdom of my Ummah. I saw the kingdom of my Ummah with the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala implemented on this earth. On both the east and the west, covering everything I saw. The promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will have a period of the Khulafa Rashidin. And they will rule with Adal and they will rule with Haq. We know also that this system will be destroyed. It will be destroyed, either in our lifetimes or after our lifetimes. But this system will be destroyed by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Prophet sallallahu told us in a sound hadith that Al-Khilafa, Satakun Al-Khilafa ala min hajj al-Nabuwa 30 ama. And the rawi of that hadith said, I counted it to the six months of Hassan. Uh, Ibn Ali and I found it was exactly 30 years just like the Prophet Sallallahu said and you can count it yourself the Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali and then Hassan for the six months equals Farathin Sana and that's the hadith and then the Prophet said it will be Muluk, Abba it will be kings that hold on to their uh, kingdom with uh, ferocious authority and then he said and then it will be Jababira, the tyrants which is the age we're in now of tyrannical oppressive rulers people who will rule right with tyranny with oppression and that's what we're seeing today and that time of oppression will remain with us as long as Allah decrees for us and then you will return on the Khilafah ala minhaj al nabuwa you will return on the Khilafah on the method of the Prophet the Prophet peace be upon him did not speak from himself he spoke from the revelation. That is a disrupting element to the power elite. When you have a teaching that is literally challenging the very foundations of that, of that structure. The Prophet wasallam, it is said that he would teach his companions, radiallahu anhum. He would teach his companions a dua to seek refuge from the Dajjal, just as he would teach them a surah from the Quran. The major signs are close. A man will come running and he will tell them, Inna Dajjal qad khalifahum fi dharariyihim. Dajjal has come out to their families. And it says that they will select Ashratul Fawaris, ten nights 
okay, ten nights to go and investigate about the coming of the Dajjal. So they will rush there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stated, I know their names, and I know the name of their fathers. They are the best of warriors at that time. You see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now preparing the worlds for the coming of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Allah says, we have removed your veil. In fact, the word apocalypse is a Greek word, apocalypsis with a K, and apocalypsis in the Greek means lifting the veil. <laughs> That's what apocalypse means. It means lifting the veil. Right? You can now see things clearly. Certain things before the end of time, no repentance is accepted. That is enough as a proof for you. And there will be many others who will come. And they will come from the government and they will come from other angles. And they will present to you a new version of Islam. A redefined Islam. A repackaged Islam. But realize the time that you're living in. And realize the one who is about to emerge upon us. Who will come and travel to every land. And people will obey him and follow him. And people who will think themselves so pious will be of him. Remember the time that you're living in. Three years before the Dajjal comes, Allah Azza wa Jal will decree that a third of the rain that normally comes stops. And a third of the vegetation and, earth and produce that comes from the earth will stop. There is going to be widespread famine. Then two years before the Dajjal comes, two thirds of the rain will stop and two thirds of the vegetation and produce of the earth will stop. And this is one of the biggest fitna, the biggest trials and tribulations of the Dajjal, the time of the Dajjal. His greatest weapon against the Muslims, against people in general, will be poverty. One year before he arrives, Allah Azza wa Jal will decree that there will be no rain and there will be no vegetational problem. Then something will happen and that is the Jal will come. He has an army and this army is 70,000 strong. They are in Asfahan. And his arrival will be between Syria and Iraq. So he will come from this land and as soon as he emerges, automatically 70,000 people will follow him and they will become his army. Al-Masih al-Dajjal will be released and he will make his way directly to Persia. He will make his way directly to Iran. When he arrives, he'll be a pious person. He, when Ayyad Billah, deceives people, lies to people, cheats people as if he's a nice person. That's how he starts. And then he goes further than that by claiming that he's what? A prophet. And then he goes further than that by claiming that he's what? A god. He will enter into every city. He doesn't go to little villages. He enters into cities. He will try to take our religion away from us. And the Jain will go to an area that is ruined. And he will command it to bring out its treasures. There's going to be a period where he's going to approach a Bedouin in the desert and he'll say to him, if I bring back your mother and father, will you believe in me? He'll say, yes, of course. And two devils in the shape of his mother and father shall appear. So he will have the most luxurious type of food with him. And he will allow them to take from it as much as they want, if they believe in him. Isn't it the jungle that come to you with the test of challenging what you believe in? in favor of something in return. He will be like Al-Masih, Isa alayhi salam. What was the miracle of Isa alayhi salam? He would resurrect the dead. He would heal the sick by the power of Allah. So too, Allah will allow him to do some of these things. It will seem that he will be able to bring back the dead. But of course, he's not really bringing back the dead. This is why he is Al-Masih al-Dajjal. He is the false Messiah. There will be drought. And he will say, I will give you you, all you got to do is say that I am the God and, and you will not die of hunger. More like the economies of the globe, all depending on one major economy that tells you if you accept us as the gods of the world, there will be no sanctions against you. The command was clear, flee from him, run away, run away. قيما لينذر بأسا شديدا من لدنه ويبشر المؤمنين
and he said, I didn't call you only for this. And then he said, there is news that has come to us from Tamim Maddari, who was a Christian who became a Muslim. And what he is telling, uh, confirms with what I have already told you about the Dajjal. For his, he was with a contingent and they were on a ship. And they were a few days stuck on, in the sea, the waves were tossing them here and there. Until they arrived on an island. He said, do the date trees of Baisan produce fruit, dates? And they said, yes. Then he asked them about the lake of Tiberias. Is there water in that lake? And they said yes. And he said soon there will come a time when the water is dried up. There will be no water in that lake. He asked them about another the spring of Zurga, I think it's called. And Zurga. And, and again it's the same thing. Does it contain water? And they said yes, and soon there will come a time when it has no water. And they're telling him information about this Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And, and then he says, it will be better if people accepted him and followed him. As for me, I am the Dajjal, and I'm waiting for my appointed time. And when I come, I will come for this length of... The Prophet ﷺ described that he will go through the whole of the earth, upon every single land not leaving anything except for Mecca and Medina. And he's going to observe the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ. The Dajjal shall say to his followers when he's camped outside of Medina, on the mountain of Uhud, on the salt marshes of Uhud, he shall camp there with his followers and he'll point to the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ. And he'll say to the people, do you see that white palace? And he will come to Medina that it will be haram for him to enter the city of Medina and enter the streets of Medina. So he will be forced to remain outside. So what he will do is that he will camp and settle on some of the salty marshes that will be outside Medina. From the city of Medina, and this is a time when, as mentioned in the previous hadith, there will be three quakes. So the believers will remain in the city, but the munafiqeen, every munafiq and every kafir, will leave the city of Medina and its safety and go out believing that they will find refuge with the Dajjal. The Dajjal shall be forced to turn to Asham, Syria. That the angels will block them. They cannot enter. And the angels will divert the attack to Damascus. And the Dajjal is going to be outside the masjid. And Imam al-Mahdi is going to be inside the masjid. And it'll be a time of Salat. And it is at that moment. When the Muslims at their weakest point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send one of his great soldiers and warriors who will descend from the heavens. Allah the Almighty will send Isa alayhi salam. Jesus, peace be upon him, will return. He will descend upon the city of Damascus. And his hands shall be resting on the wings of two angels. You know what he did also? He went to the Umayyad Mosque. And they say it's the first time that a Pope went to the Masjid. Why would a Pope go to the Masjid? What is the purpose for him to go to the Umayyad Masjid? He could go anywhere he wanted to. Why? Because in the signs of the last days, it is said that Isa alayhi salam would, would descend upon the Manara al Bayba, the white minaret in Damascus. So the Pope is covering all angles. That during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, such a minaret did not exist. He would not be the Imam. The Imam at that specific time will be the Mahdi. And he'll pray behind him. And Jesus, peace be upon him, Isa ﷺ, will not bring anything new. He will implement the Sharia of Islam, without a doubt. And he will follow the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He will not come back as a, as a prophet bringing a sharia. According to the Muslims, he actually comes back and he confirms the, the tradition of the prophet Muhammad. So Isa will march towards the Dajjal with his spear. When the Dajjal will look at him, he will melt just like salt is melted in water. And thereby allowing Isa alayhi salam to encounter, finally encounter the Dajjal at the gates of Lut, a place in Asham, specifically Palestine. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, blessed is the life after the Messiah, 
Isa alayhi salam, blessed is the life after the Masih, the heaven will be asked for rainfall, the earth will be told to grow, if you sow your seed at Safa, it will grow, and there will be no spite, no jealousy, and no hatred. When Isa alayhi salam takes up leadership, the world will truly change. A man will pass by a lion, and the lion will do nothing. Physical changes to the world. Rain will increase to the extent there will be so much vegetation. If you hear that the Dajjal, the Antichrist, has come out and you're planting the seed, then do not delay in planting that seed because after that, meaning after Dajjal, there will be life for people. Right? Meaning people will still need the provision from those trees. They will still require the fruits from that tree. And among the things we believe about Isa alayhi salam is that he shall rule the world as a just ruler and a fair judge. And during this time, as we know, Isa alayhi salam shall eradicate the pigs, eradicate swine. Why? If you wanted to ask why, what's the reason for this? He wants to emphasize his teachings. And during this time, he shall also break the cross. He will affirm the truth of Allah, the truth of Islam and deny and denounce the falsehood attributed to him that he is somehow the son of Allah or Allah even in their own books when he's asked what is the, the greatest commandment the first commandment Shema Israel Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad Hero Israel the Lord our God is one we say Kul hu Allahu Ahad say he is Allah the one and that's the truth that he will bring towards the end of time know what Rasulullah has left for us treasures of, of knowledge, gems of wisdom he has left for us in terms of the signs of the last day. Now if you look at the Christian tradition, they have some understanding of the last hour and they will speak uh, to great length about it. And the odd thing about it is they only have about five signs in their book. That's all they have. We literally have hundreds, hundreds. They have like five or six signs that the uh, uh, there would be room, wars and rumors of wars, there would be famines and earthquakes in various places, which we have all those signs, but then add all of the other signs. The Christians of this country would do well if they would come to Islam so that Muslims can explain to them the subject of the Antichrist as it has been explained to them today, as never before explained to them. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned in yet another beautiful hadith that whosoever memorizes the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf will be saved from the trials of the Dajjal. Even though he is the greatest fitna, Allah doesn't mention him in the Quran because the scholars say he is the first one in the history of the world to claim to be Allah himself. I mean, look at Fir'aun. Fir'aun said, Ana rabbukum al -a'la. I'm your Lord most high. But he never said, I'm the one who created you. I put you together. And because he makes such a profound claim, the scholars say he was not worthy of even being mentioned in the Quran. <laughs> Because when he was in his last breaths, the Rasul said to his Ummah, Please, I have left you on the clear white page. Its day, its night is as clear as its day. Do not swerve away from Allah, it. And he recited Allah's verse, Today I have perfected your religion for you and completed my favor upon you and am pleased with Islam, submission to God as your religion. Persevere on the difficult path when they came and they said, Ya Rasulullah, why on earth are you not making dua for us? When we are starving to death and we have stones around our stomachs and you, the Prophet of Allah وسلم, need to be making dua for us. And he said, Wallahi, before you a man would be brought and sawn in two pieces. An iron comb would be brought and separate his skin from his flesh. But none of that would make him waver in his religion. Would make him waver in his religion. Wallahi, this affair, Islam, will come to completion until a rider travels from Sana'a ila Hadramaut, from Sana'a to Hadramaut, la yaqafu illallah, wa dhi'ab ala ghanimihi, not fearing anyone except Allah, and the wolf upon his sheep, walakinnakum tasta'ajiloon, but you people are hasty. Bien. Oh,
He hasn't bled for Islam. He hasn't been bruised for Islam. He hasn't sweated for Islam. People run a marathon. People sail around the world on a ship. But they do that for the dunya. But we as servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala need to set the rock, set the standard, especially in this time. Be an ummah of wala and bara. Be an ummah of, of la ilaha illallah of tawheed. And never compromise in this call. The Prophet said, Kayfa fikum, ila himmatukum butunukum. What's your state when your highest aspirations are just your button? Your, your stomachs, and that means luqmat al-aish, that's ma'isha, that all you care about is your livelihood. It's just how to fill your stomach. If ever you see my ummah, if ever you see my nation afraid of saying to the oppressor, Oh oppressor, then say farewell to my ummah. Then there is a goodbye to my ummah. There is nothing left. If we ever become into, into that kind of apathetic state. You were created to know your Lord. You were created to study. You were created to delve deeply into the meaning of your very existence. The Prophet ﷺ said in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, Al-Ahdu bayni wa baynukum as-salah, fa man taraka salah faqad kafara. The, the oath between me, what's binding between me and you is the prayer. Whoever leaves the prayer has entered into kufr. And they turned the Arabs and Turks against each other because we were once one nation. It was called the last Khilafah al uthmaniyyah because we became materialistic and our pride of lineage and our pride of nationalism and our pride of racism crept into us. This was the best way to plot and plan to break us apart until today. Look at us in misery. For Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Leave it alone for it is a stinking carcass. It cannot bring anything, anything but misery, unhappiness and stink. And we have to protect ourselves against the, 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 the divide and conquer mentality of the dominant cultures that are opposing us and attacking us. He said, Ahlul Jannah. The people of Jannah are 120 rows and this Ummah takes up 80 of those rows. A hadith that indicates that this Ummah lasts uh, is half of the, the life of the Jewish Ummah and they lasted 2,000 years and so the Ummah would only last 1,000 years. The dua of the Prophet in which he said, Oh Allah, give my Ummah an extra half day. And somebody asked him, how long would that be? And he said, uh, 500 years, because the day was not last 1,000 years. And so he said it wouldn't go past 1,500 years. اللهم إني أعوذ بك من عذاب جهنم ومن عذاب القبر ومن فتنة المحيا والممات ومن شر فتنة المسيح الدجال وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله and he said whoever of you meets Asa ibn Maryam give him my greeting